All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to attempt to not use a mic, just because when I talk about uh, this work that I do, uh, I like to be very involved with my groups as opposed to standing behind the podium. So can everybody hear me? Yes. Fantastic. All right, I'm just, you know, broad a Todd speak out if I need to. Uh, just a little background about myself. I am, I need to switch presentation, so that would be helpful. <laughs> Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I've been working in the field of social work for over 10 years now, and uh, most of my career has specialized in the child welfare system for both Los Angeles and Ventura County. Uh, today, I'm the Chief Clinical Officer of Alba Walker Life Strategies. We are a group practice providing counseling services to the Canaima Valley, the San Fernando Valley, and the uh, Antelope Valley. Those of you who don't know, Lancaster, Palmdale, um, so I'm here today simply to talk about some of the work I've done in our specific community. I've had the absolute pleasure of working with many of the local districts, LA Unified, Oak Park Unified, and also LVUSD, and training teachers, counselors, and administrators on how to work with this population in an affirming way. I think what, for me, is always the most exciting is uh, as much as I like to think we've done so much for this community, it's incredible the amount of work that still needs to be done. <clears throat> so with that said, some of the things that I'm gonna go over today, I'm gonna talk about LGBTQ 101, I'm gonna talk about language, transitioning, more specifically in a school setting and what that looks like, uh, some of the local and national stats, the legal standards, and then lastly, the resources that are around our community. And then what we will finish up with is an opportunity just for questions that you may have uh, that you're welcome to ask me. And also as we go, I invite questions as well. So we're going to start off with my friend, the gender bread. <laughs> I use this as a tool uh, when I work with uh, all of the populations I work with to basically get a visual aid for working with this population. Especially with children, um, it's extremely helpful when there are visuals involved solely because it's easier for them to comprehend what's going on. So we always start with sex assignments at birth. So what's going on between a person's legs? Do they have a penis, a vagina, or do they identify as intersex? And we'll talk about what intersex is specifically in a moment. Then we go on to gender identity. So what's my inner sense of gender? Do, do I see myself more as a man, more as a woman, or gender queer? What's also going to fall under this category is gender non-binary, uh, gender non-conforming as well. Don't worry about all the definitions. We'll, we'll talk about them a little, a little more in detail, but what I strongly recommend is when a youth comes to you, ask them what that means for them, just because it'll avoid you having to do flashcards and all the stuff that comes along with all these different terms. Then you have sexual orientation. So who am I romantically, physically, and emotionally attracted to? And then lastly, gender expression. So how am I expressing my gender? Is it in a masculine way, an androgynous way, or in a feminine way? Any questions about this so far? Okay. So let's go a little deeper. So again, sex assignments at birth, again, we're strictly talking about anatomy. Do I, see, do I identify as male, female, or intersex? So for intersex, there are 40 variations today uh, of how a person can identify as intersex. I always like to concentrate on who identifies this. It's gonna be a physician. I'm very big on licenses and titles, and we'll talk about those as we go throughout the training. Uh, so I, myself, as a clinician, cannot identify intersex. I don't have the credentials to do so. Then you have gender identity. So again, this inner sense of gender. Do I see myself more as man, more as woman, or gender queer? The big thing to pay attention to between sex assignment and gender identity is the switch between male-female to man-woman. Okay. Then we have gender expression. So how am I expressing and communicating my gender? Uh, feminine, androgynous, or masculine? And then lastly, sexual orientation. So really focusing on attraction. We want to make sure that we separate with sexual orientation the idea of the physical act. Because often what happens is, oh my gosh, I'm a man and I had sex with another man, I must be gay. That's not always the case. Uh, the biggest change with sexual orientation, previously the definitions we would have utilized would be being attracted to the opposite sex, same sex, etc. Today we would say gender. So for a heterosexual person, they are attracted to the opposite gender of themselves. For bisexual, it would be two of the genders. And then lastly, lesbian and gay would be the same gender as the person. Okay? A couple more things. Gender identity. When does this develop? 
typically we see around ages two to six, okay? For sexual orientation, normally it's around ages six to 12, okay? Really want to clarify, can't stress it enough, when we're talking about sexual orientation, we're not talking about sex. When I work with parents often and I share that, their immediate freak out is, oh my God, our kids are having sex? No. <laughs> they are not having sex, but they're, they're learning to develop their attraction to other individuals and what that looks like for them. Who's heard the term cisgender? Oh my goodness, fantastic. Okay, now my next question. Anybody want to take a stab at the definition of what cisgender is? Everyone's like, no, no, I don't. Go for it. Your gender is the gender assigned at birth. Perfect, exactly. So for myself, I identify as a cisgender man because my uh, sex assignment at birth is male and my gender identity is man, okay? How about transgender? Anyone want to take a stab at what the definition is? Go for it. A person's gender identity is different than the sex they were assigned at birth. Perfect. I can like, take a seat. I don't even know how to yeah. Okay. Um, any questions about any of these areas? Okay. All right. So talking about transitions, we know throughout our lives, just in general, each of us are going to go through early childhood, pre-puberty, puberty, and adulthood. With transitioning, the important thing to consider, which often becomes confusing, is do I have to transition in order to be transgender? And the, the reality is no. I can, in fact, identify as transgender and never do any form of the transition. So typically one starts my experience with a social transition. In a social transition, everything is considered reversible. I can change my name, my pronouns, the way I dress, and I have not done anything physically to my body at that time. Then you have what's considered a medical transition. When we're talking about medical transitions, we're talking strictly about medications, okay? Uh, my experience of the clients I work with is you, usually they will utilize what are considered hormone blockers. The purpose of a hormone blocker is simply to stop puberty. And how we like to classify it is that it buys time. It buys time for the individual to really determine if this is real for them. If they determine that it's not real for them, they can simply stop taking uh, hormone blockers and they will proceed through puberty of their assigned sex. If they determine that they are in fact transgender, they can utilize what are considered cross-sex hormones and they will proceed through puberty of the opposite gender that they associate with, okay? Then lastly, you have what's considered a surgical transition. Previously, we would have referred to this as gender reassignment surgery. As of today, we like to utilize the phrase gender affirming surgery, just because we found that with sex reassignment surgery is very derogatory. Uh, as of today, in the state of California, the only insur insurance panel that covers 100% of the transition is Full Scope Medi-Cal. However, the different insurances that I've worked with, with some of the clients I've worked with, um, I've seen differences. It really depends on what insurance panel. There also are diagnoses that go along with transitioning, and that's going to also depend based on is it a clinician that can diagnose the individual, is it a physician, and it's going to vary across that. Any questions about transitioning? Okay. All right, so gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation are not determined by body parts. They are completely distinct from one another. So I always want to stress the fact that one doesn't need identity to have expression to have orientation. They're completely independent of themselves. We want to, we want to avoid assumptions. That's a huge issue with the LGBT community, is that very often, just based on how someone is dressed, there's an, <clears throat> an automatic assumption made. And then lastly, again, separating out for orientation that it's different than sexual behavior, really stressing the fact of attraction. Okay, so talking about language, um, I do a lot of this, especially with the teachers and counselors I work with in school settings. So terms like lifestyle choice, popular phase are gonna convey a sense of bias. Uh, we really want to utilize the youth's terminology of how they are feeling for themselves. Uh, using inclusive language. I always love my kindergarten teachers because I'll say how do they refer to their kids. Oh, I call them stars. Or I call them, you know, a, a lot of times they'll use the school mascot. Or friends. I had a training school the other day and all the kindergarten teachers, oh, we just say friends. The reality is, is everyone can be a friend. And that's really more what it's about as opposed to talking about boys and girls. Because for gender identity, 
creating an affirming setting, if you were talking about boys and girls and that child doesn't necessarily feel that way, they're not gonna know how to respond. And there are differences of what that can look like based on the individual. Uh, using appropriate pronouns, so she, her, and hers, uh, he, him, and his, they, them, and theirs, all or no pronoun. Again, that's gonna vary across, for me, when I've worked with school settings, that's gonna vary tremendously. What no pronoun looks like, I do get this question often, is my name is Todd and that's what I go by. I don't use pronouns, okay? And then lastly, just that misgendering is hurtful and can really damage rapport, especially in a school setting. Um, can't stress enough that I think the local districts that I've been working <coughs> with are doing so much work to support these students and it's just been wonderful to be a part of it and really see it, especially in this community. <coughs> okay. So, some of the challenges, the ones that I like to focus on the most are the fear of losing loved ones and vital resources. Uh, in Los Angeles County, there was a study a couple of years ago, 40% of youth uh, that are homeless identify as LGBT. That's both Los Angeles County and national that those numbers came out of. Uh, ultimately, we see very often that when an individual, individual does come out, it can mean immediate homelessness. Uh, just so you know what our responsibility is as mandated reporters is that we are required to report that immediately. Uh, no child is able to be refused entry into their home as long as they are a minor. Okay? All right. On the flip side, some of the benefits. We see a significant increased amount of self-esteem, stronger relationships, and just simply reducing the stress of hiding. It is extremely difficult for all of us to keep secrets in our life. Imagine kids who are six, seven, eight years old that don't really know what is going on for them and can't necessarily share, based on who they're around, this is going on for me and I don't know what to do. They don't necessarily have the language capacity to talk about it, so on and so forth. Okay, so some of the rejecting behaviors and what they can lead to, uh, we see a lot of blaming, shaming, and excluding. I, uh, years ago, um, there was a residential treatment program in Los Angeles County who had a transgender individual living in their treatment home. And they actually, uh, uh, in residential treatment, what we often see uh, is a token economy. So basically, if you do these activities, so on and so forth, you'll be able to participate in a group activity at the end of the week. Uh, the group activity was six flags, and the staff member decided that they didn't want to deal with the transgender issue. So that kid was excluded despite completing all the activities for the week. Um, what we're gonna see on the, out on the outcome side, attempted suicide, high levels of depression, uh, high risk of HIV, sexually transmitted di diseases and infections, and then lastly, the use of illegal drugs. Tremendous progress in the realm of HIV. Has anybody heard of PrEP? Okay, anyone wanna take a stab at that definition? All good. Go for, it. Go for it. So it's a prophylactic mm -hmm. um, medication that you can take that if you think you might be at risk of mm -hmm. contracting HIV, if you take this, it lowers the risk of actually having the virus. Correct. Correct. Now that is specifically PrEP. So PrEP, very much how I kind of describe it is essentially it's like birth control. It needs to be taken daily, so on and so forth, and it will protect you against HIV. Uh, in the state of California, Gavin, uh, Gavin Newsom just signed in a bill a couple of weeks ago that as of January 1st, uh, PrEP will no longer be a prescription, it will now be over the counter, and a pharmacy will be able to prescribe it. Uh, PEP is utilized if you feel that you have engaged in intercourse with someone who may be at risk of HIV. They can utilize PEP within 72 hours of contact and they will be cleared of the virus. Tremendous progress for HIV. Um, also covered by Full Scope Medi-Cal, uh, PrEP, unfortunately, as of today, and PEP are extremely expensive in our country. Um, I, I know they're estimated in the next couple of years to come out with a generic. Once that's done, it will be considerably lower, but what I've seen with the clients I've worked with, typically it's about $5,000 without insurance a quarter, so it's significantly expensive. Okay, uh, some of the stats. So 30% of completed adolescent suicides in the U.S. are LGBTQ youth. LGBTQ youth are five and a half times more likely to report a suicide attempt that required medical care. When we're talking about medical care, we're referring to a psychiatric hospitalization or having to be evaluated by an emergency room. 
Uh, Tori, I mentioned this one a moment ago, 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ across the U.S. 78% of youth who identify as LGBTQ report being bullied and harassed in their communities. And lastly, LGBTQ youth are two and a half times more likely to report clinical levels of depression. Okay. So, on the flip side, what, what occurs when some of the accepting behaviors happen? So when we see support, when we see advocacy, these are the outcomes that are gonna come out of that. Uh, we're gonna see higher self-esteem, better relationships with family, with friends, uh, just the idea that they can be a healthy, happy adult. I remember when I started my work years ago, uh, I was working with several parents and their biggest question was, is my kid gonna be able to be successful? Are they gonna be able to have a family? And when I actually shared that I happened to be a gay man and I have my master's degree and all these things, it was almost like a, whew, okay, good. Um, <laughs> solely because, and you know, we've seen significant, significant enhances with this community, but also the fact that, you know, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, a lot of changes have occurred. Um, and then lastly, just better overall health. So what to say when an individual comes out to you? Uh, thank you for trusting me with this information. How has this experience been so far? How can I support you? Um, who else are you out to and who else would you like to be out to? Uh, would it be all right if I shared this with mom, dad, grandma, the dog, whatever? Um, very important question to ask solely because we don't want to out the individual. <clears throat> and then lastly, how do you want me to refer to you in front of others? If uh, I've had a lot of experiences working with families where one parent knows and one parent doesn't. So that definitely can be complicated just because you're having to kind of, oh my gosh, we're going to a family event, what do we do? You know, half the people know, half the people don't. How do we handle that situation? <coughs> okay, so some of the federal and, uh, federal and state legal framework, uh, I'm gonna concentrate on the last three bullet points. Uh, so, most importantly, which affects me as a licensed clinician, uh, mental health professionals in the state of California, um, it's, we are prohibited from using conversion therapy to attempt to change a minor's sexual orientation. So as a licensed clinician, I answer to the Board of Behavioral Sciences, it's one of my bosses, if you will, and essentially that prohibits me from doing it. Now, there are clinicians in Los Angeles, as well as Thousand Oaks, that do in fact practice, practice conversion therapy. Fourth bullet point, California public schools are protected, or I'm sorry, students are protected from bullying and harassment based on their actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity and school personnel <coughs> must intervene if they witness it. So, as I like to say when I teach about laws, I always do like a translation, like what the heck does that mean? School staff are required to intervene. If a student is being bullied for their LGBT identity or perceived identity, regardless, school staff are required to intervene, okay? Lastly, California public school students have the right to access sex segregated programs and activities irrespective of the gender listed on their records. Translation, what that essentially means is regardless of what is in my school file, I am able to go to the restroom that I associate with in California public schools K through 12, I am able to participate in sports, regardless of what uh, is on, listed under my um, school record on my birth certificate, et cetera. Any questions about any of those? Okay. Is anybody shocked it's a quiet group? <laughs> is it just that it's Sunday afternoon? <laughs> Go for it, please. It's a lot, for me at least, it's oh, yeah. a lot of in new information to totally. digest. Totally, absolutely, absolutely. There was another, I thought I saw. I, was Go for it. I, yeah. I wasn't aware that it was a law that, um, that the last one. Yes. Have, um, I thought it had to be, like, it had to be on your school record. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, had to, you had to make that gender change, change you know, no. like a legal change. Yeah. In K through 12 public schools, I, I always okay, repeat myself a thousand times, but it's important just because it is in fact California law. Um, in K through 12 public schools, it is not required. <coughs> so. And I think what comes up off, oh, I'm sorry. When was it passed? Oh my goodness. 2014, that's right, 2014. Now, an area to consider here is the rollout, because one of the things I often get from parents is, oh, my school isn't doing that. You know, my district isn't doing that. 
I can't stress enough that this is new. And it's taken a lot of time for just school districts in general to really determine how do we address this issue. What's complicated about laws, in my experience, that I've seen, especially working in districts, is there is the law, and it's given to the school. It doesn't come with a pamphlet, doesn't come with a rule book, doesn't come with a step-by-step -step guide. So essentially, each district is responsible for figuring out what the heck do we do with this? How do we implement it? What does it look like? Uh, and that has really varied across all of the schools I've worked with in both Los Angeles and Ventura. But I think what's so important, and I stress constantly to school staff, is consulting. You know, how do we address each individual? Because all of the students are complex. Every single one has their own story, their own journey that they're going through, and how can we best support that individual? Did I miss a hand? Yeah, go so ahead. I have a curious question. You're talking about how expensive uh, prep is as yes. an app. Yes. Is that just in our country? Is that because of high pharma, mm -hmm. uh, where you can get it, where people can get it cheaper um, in Canada or Mexico? Or so, um, it's, as I always like to joke, we're extremely late to the game because mm -hmm. prep and pep have been, I want to say Australia launched prep or pep. Almost over 10 years, if not almost 15 years. So it's it's been around for quite some time. Um, we we joined the party. I want to say it was about five or six years ago in the states. I could be wrong on that, but it's more recent. Uh, as far as cost, uh, I it's it varies based on the country. That's been my experience and what clients have reported to me, especially overseas. Um, when I was first uh, introduced to what prep was, it was actually through an Australian gentleman who I met, and uh, he was part of a study years ago to be able to access it, and he gets it for life. And it was incredible to really learn about, for him, going through the AIDS epidemic, it truly was just a miracle to be able to know that he could take this medication and be protected, so on and so forth. So, yeah. Is there another? I feel like I'm maybe the shadows. Okay. Uh, the other thing, real quick, that I want to touch on with restrooms, especially in school settings, because this comes up often, uh, especially when working with trans kids as well as their parents. Uh, in the state of California, we do not have the funding to remodel every school restroom. So that comes up often, and I'll get that question about how are districts responding to that. Uh, best case scenario, we'd love to go and level every restroom and fix the issue. The challenge is funding, as always. You know, that comes up often. So just something to keep in mind. My experience with the kids I've worked with usually is that they are going to use a gender-neutral restroom on campus uh, because they feel safer. They feel more comfortable with it. OK, a couple of resources out there. Car uh, California Department of Education, the ACLU, have great, I I'm a big advocate for like, what do I do? What's my role in this? Uh, they have the ACLU specifically, which I love, has literally like a student role, a teacher role, a counselor role, a parent role, and actually tells like what each is supposed to do. So it's just a great resource to be able to utilize. And then lastly, the Fair, Edu the Fair Education Act uh, requires that California K through 12 schools provide fair, accurate, inclusive, and respectful representations of people with disabilities and people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender and history and social studies curriculum. And again, this is something that is being rolled out only because this has been actually in effect since 2009, but it is supposed to enter the curriculum. Uh, it's just taking time. Okay, so some of the resources within our community, within Thousand Oaks or PFLAG, uh, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, it's a wonderful group. Uh, there's one on another park. There's obviously a couple in the valley. I want to say there's one in Seam now. Yeah, there's one in Seam. Right? Um, and it's just a fantastic place to be able to go and really just meet different parents that are across the lifespan and have had different experiences of people who identify as LGBT. Um, Psychology Today is another great resource if you were specifically looking for a clinician in the community. Um, and that can be any community. You can actually type in your zip code as well as your insurance and be able to find someone local to you uh, who also has some type of background in working with LGBT individuals. Uh, the Thousand Oaks Teen Center, I think, does a fantastic job in just supporting this population. Uh, obviously, the Los Angeles LGBT Center is great. 
not exactly around the corner, but they are fantastic. <laughs> GSAs at high schools, the Gay Straight Alliances, we've got tons of them at high schools in our community here. Uh, we're also starting to see them pop up in middle school setting, which is fantastic. Uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles is absolutely wonderful and the best in the business. Uh, Transhairsite.org is a great resource I've utilized with parents uh, just to simply filter out doctors who specialize in transgender individuals. Uh, and lastly, Google. I mean, when in doubt, it's amazing what you can get on Google. <laughs> so, uh, with that said, here is my contact information. Uh, totally welcome questions at this time. So, happy to answer anything that anyone has. Go for it. Hi, uh, someone that's with your you remain, that shall remain nameless, uh, that I work with. Just <laughs> 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 to simplify the science of sure. gender identity, you just, you know, 24 sets of chromosomes, 26, 26 sets of chromosomes, X or Y. How do you answer the very, the, the fact that that's not the only indication of <laughs> sexual identity? So, I think with that, I would look at kids. I, I mean, I think often what I what my experience has been is, you know, as as a clinician, we're expected to have all the answers. As educators, when I work with my teachers, you know, teachers are supposed to they're supposed to know everything. Uh, I always I always love when I do the trainings I do, and I'll ask teachers the same questions I'm asking you all, and you know, I'll expect them to answer, and they're like, oh, I don't answer because I may be wrong. It's like, well, but you're a teacher. You're a teacher that wrong. Um, but specifically, I think with those situations, I really like to look at kids. I like to look at what's going on in the school setting. How are kids reporting it? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the experience of working uh, with Oak Park Unified, and I was able to participate in parent nights. Is anybody? Yeah. Oh, oh okay, great. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to be a part of that. And one we of the can't hear. Oh. Sorry, I was uh, had the pleasure of being able to participate in the parent night with Oak Park Unified. And what I saw was a variety of different questions, and it was great to be able to just talk about what kids are reporting. And I actually went back to some of my clients that I'm currently working with and posed the same questions. And one of the questions came about, about that this is different for them. This is something that is different. And my, one of my clients specifically responded and said, Todd, I, I'm confused. Like, I'm confused. And I like that word, because that word identifies what's going on for me. And basically, uh, to this client's point, he is able to appreciate the fact that he wants to talk to somebody about how he is confused. And that's where I think reflecting an individual's terminology is huge. Because if I tell them that it's something different, oh, you're not confused. You're not, you know, that's that's not our job as clinicians. Our job as clinicians is to support and provide the advocacy where it's needed. So with, with adults, it's certainly more complex because they're gonna have their own personal views, but I can't stress enough that it's reality. It really is. The stats show it. Our responsibility as social workers, and I say that often because that's my discipline in my training, I, I don't I don't need the stats that Lauren presented a few minutes ago. That's all I need to know that I have to step in. It's my responsibility and duty as a social worker. So yeah. I just wanted to go back to the bathroom thing. Sure. I have a I have a sixteen year old son who's a junior in high school and he transitioned when he was in middle school. He was the first student in his school to transition. Okay. And one thing that was really, really affirming for us and for him was that um, they turned all the single stall bathrooms into gender neutral bathrooms. So kind of like in a meeting, just wondering how can we support this, your son. Sure. Um, and so they just did that. Yeah. And then um, they also, the teachers were very open about, um, he, he's welcome to leave class anytime he needs to use the bathroom to go to like lower, he wanted to use, I mean it took him a while to decide that he wanted to go to the, the um, boys restroom and so while he was in that transition, he was um, able to go during class when there was maybe no kid there or one sure. or two kids, and so that was just very affirming. So we never got to any legal, like what's legally true, we just got to like what would be best for this child and how can we support this child's transition. So Absolutely, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. That's and great, yeah. to this point, uh, we also have a, a transgender boy, nine years old, and um, 
the transition has been very smooth in the sense that we have photo pass is just guiding us with sure. photos through and the school just follow. We don't even need the conversation. Our child, we make sure that we have a gender neutral bathroom, that it, one of the teacher bathroom was made into a gender neutral. That's and that's it's kids don't ask questions. If it's made naturally, where it's not a big deal, yeah. for us it's been simple. Yeah. And the teacher, yeah. they don't know. So you have to educate them on what to say and how to act. Totally. That's more of our experience doing right. it. It's been support of great parents around mm -hmm. us. And, yeah. and the next year, we have invited them to sit down with us, mm -hmm. have a coffee, be very respectful to one another right. opinion. And once they, we tell them about our journey, most of them have gotten it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I you, yeah. Be a parent, you put yourself in our shoes, then you can judge. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think that for like younger people, it's kind of easy to like wrap our head around this, or even from a young age, like we've grown up with people who, like in our age, of course, that have a better understanding for the LGBTQ community. And I was wondering how you would advise us to go about helping adults unlearn <laughs> their, <laughs> their like, some of their, you know, like as long held beliefs. Like I know I'm very fortunate in that my mom kind of taught me it. Sure. Because she, I don't know how she ended up being the way she is, but I have a lot of <laughs> that are like, totally you know, because we like immigrated from another country and they're kind of, you know, old fashioned and more, um, I don't know, like, they, they're coming wrong, so it's like a little bit harder to communicate with them. And sometimes they say things that are like homophobic or biphobic or transphobic, and I'll call them out, but then it becomes more of this like, ugh, like there you go being political again, instead of them understanding that like even though there is no queer person as far as you know in this room, that doesn't mean you can go about saying what you say. Like how would you recommend us communicating to those people, because I know my mom and I definitely like, struggle with trying to like get it through their heads, right. <laughs> and we might be a little too accurate sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's honestly, it's a great question, and I, I think to me, it's I can't stress enough that regardless, everybody has their own journey. Um, when when I came out, uh, I was I literally had just turned eighteen, and I remember I want to say it's been a minute, but I think it was like a Friday night. Like my mom was a kindergarten teacher, and that that last year, it was in June, she happened to um, have, I loved this, she happened to have several parents that identified as lesbian, and happened to have children that they adopted from China. It turned out like the kids came from like the same city, whatever. And <laughs> by like Sunday, her biggest thing on Saturday was like, oh my gosh, you're not gonna, like you can't have a family, you can't raise kids, all that stuff. And by Sunday, she like woke up with this epiphany of like, oh my God, honey, you can adopt a little girl from China. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, I was like, great, great mom, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so like, look, look at all the progress, right? Just um, But for my father, he definitely really struggled and, and had, I want to say it took him about probably like anywhere from four to six months to really come around. Um, the best part was when I met uh, my boyfriend slash husband today, he was a teacher, or is a teacher, and I remember my mom telling my father, give up, the state has his prince, he must be fine. Um, so, so needless to say, I think that it's really about respecting that just everybody on either side has a journey. And I think that you know, one of the things, and I, I do this when I train, my responsibility is not to convince everyone in this room to support this population. My job is really to convince one. That's all I have to do. Um, just judging by people's responses and what I'm looking at, it sounds like I'm doing better than one, which is good. <laughs> um, but regardless, it's really to me about just respecting everyone's journey and respecting that sometimes it takes an individual going through something themselves to really understand what that's about for them. Um, so. I think the biggest issue with a lot of people I know is like they don't think they know any like gay people. Like, sure. And they're like, it's more of like a microaggression. Like, we don't hate gay people. It's just like, it's just a joke. Like get right. over it, you know what I mean? And so that's when it kind of becomes totally. difficult to communicate that like your joke isn't funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think 
think as always, it's important to, to communicate what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. So like as a clinician, we talk a lot about I statements. So saying something like, hey, when you mentioned that, you know, it hurt me, period. <laughs> you know, not going to oh my gosh, it hurt me because it made me feel really bad and it made me think of this time 20 years ago and this story, that, you know, we don't need to get into all that detail. But really just talking about that I statement of like, hey, when you mentioned this, it made me feel really bad. Simple as that. Sometimes that can have an impact and sometimes it can't. Mm -hmm. And I think as an individual, it's really more about just realizing, at least from my perspective, everyone's gonna take their time and what's gonna work for them. Um, and sometimes that time may be five minutes, it may be five days, it may be five years, and it may be never. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I apologize, I'm not noticing hands, so go for it. I'd like to kind of take that and sort of reframe the question and sure. redirect it a little bit more, if, if you, if I may. Go for it. Because in, in Thousand Oaks, we do have a segment of the community that's taken this whole issue here and politicized it sure. and heated it up. Sure. What seems to be with clear intent. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in some cases, you see people who are seem to be repeating misinformation mm -hmm. sort of quasi-innocently. Mm -hmm. They're the mm -hmm. conduit. Mm -hmm. In other cases, they might very well be the source of deliberate misinformation. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, in your experience dealing with different communities mm -hmm. here in the Valley, in Santa Clarita, mm -hmm. are you encountering that personally and to the degree that you are? Mm -hmm. Do you have certain, oh, um, uh, strategies or language that you use to kind of diffuse the politicization of something that should not be political in nature? Yeah. <laughs> 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 is is looking at the comparisons of the communities because I've had the pleasure of working with so many different populations and backgrounds and ethnic groups and I mean you name it at this point I've pretty much done it I've done everything from like Long Beach out to Lancaster out to Santa Barbara and whatever's in the middle so uh, let's see I mean here's what I can tell you based on where I've worked LA Unified as of right now from my experience doesn't seem to be having the issues globally, if that makes sense, that I'm seeing out here. Um, now, when you get into specific schools at LA Unified, that's gonna look differently. You go out to Lancaster, you've got a very different population uh, to work with. Uh, I've seen significant amount of you know white supremacy out there, which is obviously gonna be a just whole other slew of things. Um, so, but to get away from the political, I mean, I, I, I think to stress, I love the title of what um, y'all said to call this today. So separating fact from fiction, right? So really talking about what is in fact going on in school settings and what is not going on in school settings. I can't stress that enough. And ultimately, I, I'm, I'm a social worker, I'm optimistic, we're supposed to be. So <laughs> what I often think about is while well, there may be someone who is just shouting out a bunch of things, some true, some not true. My hope is, is that people will listen to what is factual and what's actually happening in school settings. I think uh, to speak to it, Oak Park is a concrete example because it's recent. Uh, obviously, we've seen a number of things that parents have talked about. And really, the night of the parent night, which I thought was so wonderful, I would say, from, from my knowledge, about 10% of folks sitting in the room were not supportive of what was going on in the Parks District. Uh, I would say maybe 50% were, and then you had kind of that 40, like, didn't know what this was, and I want to be able to come to this meeting and find out what it was. And they left with the answers they needed. And I think that's where events like that are so powerful, because let's actually talk about what we're doing. Let's show you what we're doing. I know one of the things that when I met with these folks and they talked to me about, what the heck is Todd training in these schools? These are in fact the slides. Now just to be clear, my trainings are anywhere from two to six hours. 
So you've got a very Reader's Digest version <laughs> of what I do, and it's going to be based on the discipline of the person I'm working with. Teachers are going to get a very different training than, let's say, a counselor or a clinician who just has more ability to focus on certain areas of this uh, complexity area. So, yeah. Yes. I've spent a good deal of my life working at the university and college level, and I'm wondering if a lot of the things that you're doing are also being done at that level, because I don't see a lot of it where I work. If I, do you mind if I ask what university you went to? Uh, well, I retired from Cal State University. Oh, okay, okay. And it's a pretty progressive university, but right. I don't see a lot of it. So, I'm if you have mm -hmm. any idea of what's going on at that level? So every, I, what I've seen, every school is different. Uh, a lot of students I've worked with have reported, I don't know if anyone's at UCSB, but as I understand it at UCSB, they're actually having students convey uh, what their gender identity is in classrooms as well. they're a little more progressive than anything. I just my yeah. daughter went. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's what I've heard. Um, I think every university, every program is different. I know CSUN's got a fantastic MSW program and an MT program, so I would know that they would be teaching it. Um, I think it's just gonna vary where you are. Part of what I've seen is the shift, because ultimately what we're seeing more and more, and we are catching up with what's going on, even as clinicians, um, these things are happening earlier than they ever have. Uh, you know, my, uh, my mom's cousin happens to be LGBT, came out at a very late age. I came out when I was 18. I'm now seeing kids as young as six that are disclosing, even younger, that are disclosing some, some things that are going on for them that more relate to gender non-binary, not knowing what gender they associate with. So needless to say, all the work we're doing has not really been targeted for those populations. Um, one of the uh, things that we're having issues with currently due to all of our suicidal ideation going on not only in this community, but just our surrounding districts with depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth, our, su our suicide assessments are not built for children. They're essentially built for typically ages 12 and up. Um, and we're assessing kids in school setting that are six years old for ideation. So the challenge is, is making sure that a clinician does it to ensure that the questions are answered appropriately, <coughs> only because you know some folks may not have the experience to uh, on how to address those individuals appropriately. Yes. I know that um, within the UC systems, there is a lot that's coming about in terms of you know there's student health centers that are having kind of LGBT broad care, gender affirming care, the um, Usually the college counseling centers have folks who have expertise in, in working with gender diverse and LGBTQ identified folks. The UC system actually has um, identified folks um, typically within the mental health field that have uh, inner collaboration and communicate about being more supportive for youth. Um, most campuses, a lot of the campuses have student um, like LGBT centers. LGBT centers, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. And I think, while I don't know, I haven't heard about like University is outright asking folks pronouns. Um, I have, I do know that at least in UCLA, there's a lot of support for you who come in identifying as a gender different than their legal gender marker um, and supporting you and having their outward facing kind of papers and ID and things be supportive of who they are. At that level, I'm pretty sure it's there. I was more yeah. concerned about the community colleges in the state. I don't know yeah. as much about, about those right now, actually. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this. Hands up, who or, or, or for who has questions? I'm sorry, um, let me specify that. Let's go like left to right because I feel like I'm missing people. Go for it. Um, how can we get like our teachers, like let's say at our elementary school, to like get this training of, you know, what we're districts? learning now? <laughs> like, how um, can, which, I mean, which districts? Are you talking? Are you talking generally or? Well, I mean, of course, I would love it at my school. My school is okay. at CVUSD. Okay. So. I mean, I don't know, like, can we have, I, I don't know, like, what are the steps, do we have to go to the school board to do that, or can we just say, hey, a few parents of us at our school, like, hey, we're going to have a little group such, anyone who wants to come out, I don't know, like, can uh, we do that, or? So, so really, really good question. Because um, so I feel like this is, like, I feel like at our school, like, I feel like a lot of teachers are very, 
the mind is, but like we all need like guidance and right. you know and for sure. I think we could all benefit from it. Right. Uh, so uh, what I would say is it varies. Um, I've been brought in for a variety of different reasons in the districts I've worked with. Uh, uh, LBUSD specifically put together, I think it was about three years ago now, I'm a community, or a student 360. Is anybody LBUSD in here? All right, all, all good. Uh, a student 360 component, and part of that is, is really looking at the student from all vantage points. So LGBT, anxiety, depression, everything that goes on for an individual, they brought in every single trainer uh, that over, I want to say it was two years, and covered all of that for their teachers to ensure those things were addressed appropriately, and it's still continuing today. Uh, that was LBUSD. Uh, Oak Park, I was brought in specifically, and I'm very transparent right now due to a lawsuit. Um, a teacher uh, misgendered a student uh, despite their legal name change on a birth certificate and decided to refuse to call the student by their name that they associated with. And uh, that's why I was brought in for that, solely because um, uh, it was part of the litigation of the lawsuit. Uh, so again, it's just going to vary. Uh, I have attempted to get into CBUSD a couple of times uh, through different uh, avenues, um, Breakthrough, which is absolutely fantastic. I've worked with them on a couple of projects. Unfortunately, there just hasn't been, a, I'll say, a, maybe a need yet for it. Um, and I apologize if I've offended anybody saying that. Um, but, but, that's, <laughs> but that's what I've, what I've been shared, what's been shared with me. Um, I can't stress enough that the training is just a great way to be able to talk about it. Um, every teacher and counselor I've met with CBUSD, the minute they talk to me, they're like ripping my business card out of my hand to get it back to the district. Um, but nothing's come of it just yet. Uh, hopefully, um, our, the organization I work with is also targeting Simi Valley and Moore Park Unified just because clearly there's a need in our community specifically. So I think it's a great training and I think it belongs in every single K through 12 school. Um, I'd love to see, often my elementary school teachers at the start of the training are very like, what the heck am I doing here? Like, this is high school. And then when they find out gender identity is two to six, they're like, oh my gosh, I need to pay attention to this. Um, so, yeah, it's a really good idea. Uh, if, I can add, if I can add to what Todd said, if I can add to what Todd said, um, please go to your, your, our, school district <laughs> meetings and speak at public comments because then those of us who take notes during those, at the end of the meeting it says additional future topics. And we can say, as the speaker said, can we get a training program for our teachers and we can bring that up to have on a future agenda. Yeah. And I fully yeah. really intend to do that. Thank you. disingenuous but 
How do you counter that? So for me, oh, I'm sorry. I just think there needs to be more understanding. Well, so as, as a clinician where I go, I go back to the stats. So what I would say to that person is I hear you and the stats say otherwise. Um, I don't care if there's one student, our responsibility as educators is to address that one student. So it's interesting that I, I was sitting on a panel of, a, um, of educators recently and you know their suicide rates in their specific school site, so not district, school site, were at 10%. So 10% of their high school students were reporting suicidal aviation. Oh my gosh, that's not that bad. Okay, I mean, yeah, sure, it's not that bad. Be nice if it was zero. So it's, it's to me in those situations, I, zero is our responsibility. So I, I would, stress that completely and just really talk about the stats because they do speak for themselves. Um, bullying in this, in our uh, school setting today, I was talking about this with a couple of counselors recently. Um, I remember bullying when I was a kid, and not to say that it was bad, but uh, when I was in middle school, I was called a fag almost on a daily basis. And all I remember was that was essentially the extent of it. You know, I was called a fag and like the student would keep walking. I also had the pleasure of being able to leave at 2.30 and it was done, I got a break. Um, unfortunately today, we are seeing just enhanced egregious bullying that it's, it does not stop the fact. It is ongoing harassment online, on social media, all day long. Bullying is now 24 seven. It is no longer Monday through Friday from like eight to two. Um, those days are long gone. So. That's typically what I will say when addressing those individuals. Um, and again, just al always, always remembering for us to respect that they're gonna have their own journey. Just like we are, that person is gonna have their own journey as well. So, yeah. We've got, oh, oh of course. <laughs> I have a question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak for my completely non-professional and, and uh, non-expert uh, view to answer Sharon's question. As far as I'm concerned, if you are telling kid, if, you are, if your attitude is, we don't need to train teachers or educate students in the issues around gender identity or LGBTQ kids in general, my answer is, when you just tell kids don't bully, you're not building understanding or empathy. You are suppressing behaviors that they might engage in otherwise because of their ignorance. And I think that if we look around us since 2016, we see a lot of what happens when people stop suppressing. And um, I think that the answer is to educate and to build empathy, not just to tell kids, don't bully other kids. I think also I'm gonna piggyback that actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll you then, okay, well, we got you, we got you covered. I think where I will piggyback that and what my experience has been around this, it's, well, well I had a neuron firing or whatever you call it. Um, but I think what we have seen with social media is kids have access to it. Um, I, I love parents who say to me like, oh my gosh, but like I've, I've got, you know, I've got the passwords and I've got, guys, there's Starbucks. You know, oh my god, my kid won't go to Starbucks anymore. Okay, they can go to McDonald's, they can go to Jack and Bob, they can go anywhere. Um, Wi-Fi is accessible. I think what I've seen and what we have seen in school settings is that kids are watching what's going on visually in our country. And I want to be very clear, I'm not getting political. I'm not talking about Democrats and Republicans. I'm just simply talking about what they are exposed to. They are being given permission to do what they're doing. So it's so in a way I would argue it's it's confirming their ability without permission that they can in fact behave this way. If that makes sense. Okay? So and I really can't stress enough that it's it's not about party affiliation. It's the same reason that if I was showing a clip of a certain situation that we're just gonna learn from it. We're gonna be exposed to it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that I think something important to address um, as far as why education is necessary for teachers and students 
is because there's a difference between acceptance and um, understanding. And as a trans guy transitioning in middle school, um, I luckily didn't, I was not bullied. Everybody was very accepting. But that doesn't mean everybody was understanding, even teachers. Right. Teachers that I had never known me before eighth grade called me she and her every single class period. Not because they wanted to be mean to me, mm -hmm. but because they didn't understand the importance of not misgendering somebody. I had kids who would call me my birth name on a regular basis, even after being corrected numerous times. Not because they wanted to offend me, but because they didn't understand how important it was for me to be called by what my name actually is. Sure. So that's one of the reasons why I just want to say education is absolutely necessary, even if bullying is not happening or that kind of thing. Absolutely. 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 I kind of want to piggyback on that as well. Um, when, uh, for example, I think we also need to kind of refer to the siblings too. So um, my transgender daughter is five, and she has a nine-year-old sister who's in third grade. Can we just stand up? You can't hear me. Sorry. Right. <laughs> She's nine. Uh, or my transgender daughter's five, and she has an older sister who's in third grade. And all of her friends knew prior to the transition, and now they're both on the same campus together at school. So the question then becomes, didn't you have a brother? What happened to your brother? <laughs> so we need to make sure that what we're doing is that it, this goes, you know, and teachers at our school don't know what to do. We're kind of like, oh, I, don't, I don't really know how to explain this, and so there's been situations where my five-year-old's been left to educate for herself. And so the education is so paramount and so important for all of these kids so that they can understand, so that my nine-year-old can speak to um, it as well. Absolutely. Cool. Speak for both. Absolutely. So, so no. Did you repeat the question? 
so uh, Bill is asking whether or not, if I can say Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when you are in fact LGBT, is it contagious? <laughs> no, no what, I really no, meant, right. what I really meant was that no. the, the view that was expressed no. yes. was that if you expose a whole class Absolutely. of transgender and LGBT issues, that the straight kids are going to want to change because they're going to, you know, and, and that's, I mean, that was what I meant by uh, uh, contagious. Right. But the word, right. is there any proof that you change yeah. kids' minds? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the old yeah. truth. Yeah. 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 It's a stupid question, but there's a one of this. How do I address that? So, so it's a really. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, to, to, to jump on Bill's point, yeah. I, I was at the street fair and I was given oh. a big pamphlet of information today with a lot of facts on it. And okay. in the spirit yeah. of coming here to separate fact and fiction, uh -huh. is there a way to go through these? Maybe not in real time. To kind of to, to put an FAQ together or have one site or somewhere we could really understand what's real real data versus sure. cherry picking. Um, if I can ask, what's your source? What's that's the a horrible source. <laughs> they, have, oh. they have a nice flyer. I mean, okay. <laughs> At least the flyer's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just, yeah. 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 So we can, uh, if Coming you like. something that counteracts when someone dances, yeah. Well, it's short. What is that? Short. So the, well, the this is the California Parent Alliance. Okay. Yeah. That, 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 that. So what I can do, if you'd like, uh, we probably don't have enough right now, but I'm happy to take a look at it later. And, you know, I can certainly work with John and Gina and Mary and Lauren and see what we can do to respond. Because that's just some of what we're doing. Yeah, and, and I think ultimately, yeah. I mean, this is what I can't stress enough for what specifically I'm, I'm guessing we're getting at Oak Park and what Oak Park is doing. Uh, they're not teaching kids to be LGBT. They're teaching about gender diversity and inclusion. We're all different regardless of where we come from, our upbringing, our color of skin, you name it. That is what they are teaching about. And I can't stress that enough, that it's inclusivity. Um, each of us have different pasts, different experiences, so on and so forth. That's all they are teaching. Respect. Yes. Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. Okay, 20 hands just went up. <laughs> All right. I feel like I haven't hit this section, so let me let me start with you in the back just okay. because I know you've had a hand up for a minute. Go for it. Uh, I said, oh, 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 sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the other hand. The other hand. So I'm actually from the Bay Area. I'm okay. to Los Angeles for school. Oh, so, welcome. Because it's the same thing when minor, racial minorities are in representation in Absolutely. the media. Just because you see a racial minority doesn't mean you're going to turn into one. You're still going to be one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing with you see right. an LGBT in the media. And Absolutely. I also wanted to point out um, from earlier, as I thought, when you mentioned conversion therapy mm -hmm. existing in LA County mm -hmm. and Thousand Oaks, how prevalent is it here? In Thousand Oaks? Yes. As of right now, there are four practicing clinicians in Thousand Oaks. Okay, because I'm scared because I'm bisexual. So. Right. <laughs> so, yes. so what we are, just to kind of clear up what our responsibility is as clinicians, and this is what I understand these clinicians are doing, I do know one happens to be a psychiatrist. So technically, legally, what I, I'll speak for myself, what I can do is I could, in my office, take down my license, essentially, practice conversion therapy for the hour, have my client leave, and then put my license back on the wall. Because uh, as a licensed clinician, we're responsible to have it in public view when we're providing clinical services. Um, I'm still unclear how this, these particular individuals are doing what they are doing, because I do know they report to the same entity I do. Uh, but in fact, I mean, essentially what usually happens is our licenses uh, Usually it starts with um, them being suspended and there's an investigation done. You know, not done wood, I don't want to have to go through one of those. Um, but that's my understanding of what it looks like. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, let's just kind of go, go for it. Okay. Um, uh, sort of to piggyback on the idea about accepting and then also like an understanding. <laughs> um, 
So I like, wanted to see if you had like advice or if anyone had advice of how to go about for like my son who has a very good friend who's going through this and he's 10 years old and um, you know like there's gonna be name changes soon sure. and like pronoun changes soon and I know he's gonna be accepting but when you said understanding right. like how do I go about that like I don't you know I don't want to just say like okay so so is now gonna be so and so like I don't know how to bring up that conversation. Right. So I have a strange answer for you. <laughs> you may not have to. Kids don't respond the way adults do. Correct. So um, <laughs> no, no offense. No. <laughs> God, there are a bunch of adults here. <laughs> kids don't typically respond the way adults do. Uh, my experience, especially working with kids that come out in school settings, especially at elementary level. Um, usually in a lot of cases, uh, kids are presenting and have been presenting for some time. So really the, the biggest change, if you will, is the name. Right. Um, yes. But for kids, it, there was an elementary school in the area years ago where a trans kid transitioned over winter break. And literally the biggest question for the kids was, can we still play soccer at lunch? <laughs> so that's now. The bigger questions came later when parents found out and, you know, I can say all hell broke loose. But needless to say, that's where we as a district, as a school site, have a responsibility to protect that child. It's completely confidential and we are not required to share. What came out of that specific school was uh, parents were very frustrated that they were not informed. They felt a letter should have been sent home disclosing the situation. <laughs> they could talk to their child in their way. Uh, it's kids privacy. We're not able to do that and we can't release any information. The same reason that we wouldn't release information from another student. So, yeah. And I think really just answering the questions to get to if, if, if the child does have questions. Are my nephews and nieces, I've got tons of them, you know, they, they bring up those questions all the time, like, where's Uncle Todd's wife, you know? And the hysterical part is I'm one of five brothers. So needless to say, uh, it so happens two of us are gay. So I remember when our first niece was born, like, the nurse was like, oh my gosh, like, this kid's got 12 uncles, you know? <laughs> 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 I think it's really just about answering the questions and that it's age appropriate. Um, I get asked often, like, oh, if they're five, do we say? I, I think you answer the question. If a kid is, answer is asking the question, they're wanting the answer. And I don't think you have to go into a massive dialogue. Um, there are wonderful books out there, just in general, that teach, uh, I shouldn't say teach, the stories are about inclusion, about different families. And, you know, families today are so different than they were years ago. Um, there's a, I can't remember the name of it. About all the different families? You read it in your classroom, don't you? I know, I don't remember it. It's gotta be on Amazon. But anyway, <laughs> it talks about how, you know, one child comes from a home that's like a grandma and, and an uncle, and another child comes from a home with two moms, and another child comes from a home of a single parent. So needless to say, just different types of families, different backgrounds, so on and so forth. All right, I'm just gonna keep moving. Go for it. Yep. Okay, so yep. I know you're talking about Oak Park. I actually went to Oak Park High School. I went to Medea Creek and Oak Hills. Like, I did the whole, you know, so all Oak of Park it. Yeah, yeah, and I have, like, have developed very close relationships with some of my teachers mm -hmm. from my high school. So, like, I, you know, tend to text them, whatever. And I have this one teacher who contacted me and was like, he told me about what was going on with mm -hmm. the whole, like, lawsuit and everything. And he was mm -hmm. like, it's crazy because now that they have all of these like gender inclusive and like LGBTQ inclusive curriculums, there is a like really, really harsh backlash of parents. Sure. And I was wondering how you would recommend, or how like, I don't even know if it's like a recommendation or what, or like how you are going about trying to Address deal with that. that. Yeah, because I always thought of Weirdly, Oak Park is a pretty progressive school. I wouldn't say within the student body because I've had like issues with them, but there are a lot of teachers I find that like, even in class, if someone would say something or ask any questions, like they did have answers prior to this training because I, I graduated in 2018, like yeah. prior to all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering how you go about dealing with all that. So, so they're charged forward. 
I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, I mean, the the administration, like the trainings are happening. They're happening now. I believe they they're like two to three weeks into the elementary school students receiving the uh, the lessons that are being taught. They're not gonna they're not gonna stop. It's just who this district is, which is really fantastic. Um, uh, what they have seen as far as absences go, because obviously parents do not have the ability in that specific district to opt out, mm -hmm. uh, but they can obviously pull their kids out. You know, that's yeah. completely appropriate. Um, but they've seen a variety of differences, uh, but in all seriousness across the district, the absences have been relatively low. Oh, that's great. So, and I've even heard reports from some of the school counselors, uh, which is kind of cute, I thought it was cute. But uh, one parent pulled their child out, and literally the child knew what the lessons were going to be taught, and was like furious leaving the classroom, and like, oh my god, like my mom's just uptight, and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I I think that the, to me, I like to think of it as it's like an infection, right? Like we want to infect the good stuff. Yeah. So so to me, even something like that is so powerful because right there you know that student that regardless of them not receiving uh, the lesson being taught, they're still able to be a part of it and support it. Um, I also know that several of the teachers, which I think is wonderful, um, a lot of the kids, which is very common, if any teachers are in the room, uh, came back and were frustrated they couldn't participate in the activity because uh, every lesson had an activity. So uh, the teachers actually requested the counselors provide extra copies so the kids could just do the activity. So, right. so yeah. and then the high school I know has, did they also change their curriculum? Because I know we have one health teacher, mm -hmm. so right. like that one health teacher seems to be pretty like, mm -hmm. progress. so like they've, they've also done that? So there are two different parts to it because the K through five lessons that are being taught are completely different. Mm -hmm. So to my knowledge with what Oak Park has done, seven through 12, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Oak Park has been practicing and gender inclusion and diversity for almost five years. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it just kind of happened that this was more of a recent, you know, thing. Yes? Uh, I just wanted to thank this for uh, you know, people up here. Oh. 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 Um, Sorry. To just uh, any of the parents or uh, just anyone who doesn't really, like if they hear the term rapid onset dysphoria, what exactly that is, because mm -hmm people use it as a sign fit thing, but from like all the articles I've read, you can trace it back to the group that it's from. It's a hate group, it is not a scientific group, and they, what was the name? The name of the, one? I don't know, some name, and it, it sound, it's really close to like, um, like a. Yeah, they, it's not the World Health Organization, they call themselves something very close to that. Mm -hmm. You think, oh, that's that big group, but it's not. There's so much misleading. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can trace back to hate groups. There, I mean, there could be something, but I don't think it would be accurate if there, if it was. But um, it's basically the idea that in um, people will say this if, like, their child seemingly is like, oh, I'm trans, and they're like, I didn't see any signs, or like, or they'll use it. It's basically the whole idea of saying that because there's uh, trans media or like people they know were trans, that it, it made their child trans. <laughs> And it's like really ridiculous. And so yeah, if you just hear that, just know there, to my knowledge, and I doubt anywhere, there isn't scientific proof based in this. It's used by hate groups. Thank you. Go for it. Um, there's a group called the Gender Dysphoria Working Group, which actually publishes um, it's a website, you can check it out, and it actually addresses most of the controversies. One of the primary 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 ones being rapid onset gender dysphoria and the actual lack of scientific evidence for any sort of social contagion phenomenon tied to being a gender diverse person. Um, but it does address a lot of the different kind of controversies and the misleading information that gets put out there and cites the evidence. So that's a really good research based, evidence based site. Gender dysphoria working group. They have a Facebook group, they have a website. Um, if you Google is under this and it's a group of um, like clinicians, physicians, um, Joe Olson for the folks who yeah. affiliated, see affiliated something or another, part of that. Um, yeah. Stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Did you
Jesse, you've got some. Oh, I was, I was just going to say that hearing kind of all the concerns, I feel like we have to start at the local level and the most important thing is going to the school board meetings to just get education for parents, teachers, students. Mm -hmm. I feel like education will be the beginning of especially parents understanding why I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't be obligated to tell everyone I'm trans when you're not obligated to tell me you're cis. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, one, one more. No, just go for it. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for participating, and I especially want to thank Todd. This has been amazing.